now you should be able to. I think you should be all set now. Sorry about that. Great. So now we are being recorded. Um, and Roshini, if we could go on to the next slide. Uh, like last time, I'd like to uh, invite everyone to introduce themselves so we know who all is on the line. Uh, so just a quick rundown. I'll try to run through the names in the panel. And I'll start with uh, myself, Travis Dunn, CDM Smith, project man consultant project manager for the Road Usage Charge uh, Research Project. Uh, Roshini, you're next in my queue. Hello, Roshini Durand. Uh, I am with CDM Smith and also working on this project. And I'm in specifically the task lead for the innovation uh, section, which you have seen me talk about a few weeks ago. Thanks. Brian Ziegler. Thanks, Travis. Brian Ziegler, Freight Mobility Strategic Investment Board. Good morning, everybody. Morning. Tom's iPhone. <laughs> Uh, Tom Hinkson, Everett Transit. Uh, I'm joining you as I'm driving, but listening. <laughs> Hopefully just listening and not walk, watching and texting. Thank you, Tom. Exactly. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm fueling. Now I'm driving. Okay, Thanks. good. <laughs> uh, Representative Cliburn. Hi, uh, Judy Cliburn, former transportation chair. Aaron. Morning, everyone. Aaron Halbert, financial analyst with the Transportation Commission. And dedicated participant in the workshops we're about to hear about today, Allegra. Allegra Calder with Burke Consulting, part of the Road Use Charge team. Sharon. Sharon Nelson, former utility regulator and uh, consumer advocate. Annalise. Hello, Annalise, CDM Smith. Kurt Augustine. Hi, Kurt Augustine. I'm with the Alliance for Automobile Manufacturers, and the uh, uh, we are representing the uh, auto manufacturers as well as many of the technology provided for this topic. Thank you. Commissioner Jennings. Roy Jennings uh, with the commission. Commissioner. Anthony. Thanks. Good morning, uh, Anthony Buckley, Director of Innovative Partnerships at Washtenaw. Dana. Dana Kwan with the House Republican Caucus. Thanks, Dana. Debbie, I think it's Debbie Driver. Yes, good morning, everyone. Debbie Driver, Governor Inslee's Transportation Policy Advisor. Thanks, Debbie. Doug. Good morning, Doug Vaughn, uh, DOT. Hi, Ping. Good morning, Hai Ping Zhang, Department of Licensing. Jennifer Harris. Hi, Jennifer Harris, uh, staff to the House Transportation Committee. Jill. Uh, Jill Johnson, Department of Licensing. And another dedicated participant in the workshop series that we're about to talk about, uh, Commissioner Fukai. Good morning, Commissioner Fukai from Spokane County. Connor. Good morning, Connor Lindsay, Legislative Assistant to Senator Steve Hobbs. Martin. Good morning, uh, Martin Presley with the uh, Senate Republican Caucus. Matthew. Matthew. <clears throat> Matthew Dorfman, CDM Smith, providing technology and policy support to this project. Another dedicated workshop participant. Thanks, Matthew. Representative Orcutt. Yeah, Orcutt, still state representative, still in the 20th district, but with redistricting, who knows what district I'll be in in a year. Senator Fortunato. Senator, if, if you're there, we, um, you're muted. Sorry. So, no worries. Uh, Senator uh, Fortunato, 31st District, and staunch supporter of the opposition of road usage charge. <laughs> <laughs> Michael Vilnay. 
Paul Villeneuve here. I'm with the Washington Division of Federal Highways. And Tom Walrath. Good morning, Tom Walrath. I'm with Walrath Trucking in Tacoma, representing the Washington Trucking Association. Great. I think I got everyone. Is there anybody who um, would like to say good morning that I missed in, in going through the list over here? Okay. Well, thanks very much again for your attendance. It's great to see you all here. And uh, Senator Fortunato, I know as a member of the Honorable Opposition, <laughs> uh, one of the issues that uh, has uh, plagued road usage charging that you're concerned about and, and others are as well is cost of collection. So that's what we're here to talk about today, uh, what we've been doing about it over the course of a series of research workshops over the past few months. So Roshini, if you could jump right in. Um, I'll start with the objectives and then we'll talk through what we did, what we learned and what we will do next with this information. And, and uh, again, to put it all in context, uh, what we're leading up to at our December steering committee meeting is a presentation of the uh, full slate of uh, pilot tests, mini tests that we would like to field in 2022. So uh, as we lead up to that meeting, your input is most valuable so that we can prepare and craft and present to you all in December excuse me, a slate of projects that uh, will be valuable, but also uh, have your interest in uh, supporting the, their conduct and, and your participation in them too. So uh, on to this topic of cost of collection reduction. This is the approach that we took. First, we did background research uh, to create a cost analysis framework. We identified uh, what we called challenge statements that we could organize a series of workshops around. And importantly, we invited partner agencies because we decided that um, it's not, it's not um, sufficient to rely on scale to reduce the cost of collection in a road usage charge program. The notion that, oh, if you have a few thousand vehicles, it's costly to collect, but once you scale to 100,000 or a, a million or a few million, costs will come down. That is true, uh, but we wanted to explore other ways of reducing costs more systematically that weren't reliant on scale alone. And we thought that one way to do that would be to explore opportunities for collaborating across states. So we invited partner agencies to participate. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Next, we organized three workshops with the project team, including the commission and our uh, project partners. For each of the three workshops, we created a background briefing. Um, we posed a challenge statement around which each workshop was organized. And then we had a dedicated series of work sessions over the course of one week. And at the end of that week, we had uh, small groups from each workshop present findings. Coming out of those workshops, what we are looking for are public policy uh, elements that could be included in any legislation related to road usage charging that, are, that is helpful for reducing costs specifically, but also system design concepts and concepts that can be carried forward for testing, either in the WARUC tests coming up in 22, or uh, as recommendations for other states and the federal government who's funding this work uh, for future testing elsewhere as well. So those four bullets on the right, public policy elements, system design concepts, and concepts for testing are the three main objectives of the workshop, the workshop series that we undertook. And, um, <clears throat> most immediately concepts for pilot testing. So what we'll be working toward in today's presentation is uh, working through some of the insights of the workshops, but also what did we finish with and where will we go next in terms of pilot testing? I'll start with the analysis framework. You have all seen this before. Um, we thought this was helpful for understanding how to break down the elements of a road usage charge system and identify which pieces of this are more costly or drivers of the cost of collection. And it turns out almost all of these functions are things that already happen in, in most states uh, for things like vehicle registration, certainly. The only piece of this that's new is the um, third, fourth, uh, excuse me, second, third, and fourth elements, which are generating mileage data, accessing the data, and then applying a per mile charge rate to it. Um, so of course, these are also the most costly pieces of a road usage charge system to date. Um, so we thought 
in addition to focusing on how can we make the, the uh, task of collecting mileage data more cost effective, how can we look more holistically at how it fits into this broader process? We posed five challenge statements with our partner agencies and then had, had a series of, of uh, rankings where we down selected to the top three most popular. And these are the uh, statements or the, the, excuse me, the subject matters for each of the statements that were selected. There were customer service, enforcement, and then procurement and certification. I'll talk through each of these. We conducted a week long workshop in, in September for the customer service and late September for enforcement and about a month ago on procurement and certification. In addition to the commission and project team, we had um, dedicated participation from the Department of Licensing in each of these three workshops. So I want to thank Jill especially and all of your colleagues, Jill. Um, Recording in who made this a successful uh, series of workshops. And also we had participants from the Orego program uh, run by Oregon Department of Transportation who, who were equally helpful in uh, providing insights from their experience operating a RUC program for the past, oh, uh, six years. Okay, a few assumptions before I launch into the three um, workshop summaries. Um, in order to guide the discussions in each of these three workshops, uh, we wanted to provide some, some boundaries or some scenarios that folks could think through. So these are three key assumptions that you can think of as applying across the discussion of our uh, cost of collection reduction explorations. First, um, we imagined having a manual method of mileage reporting based on self-reporting that would be offered by the Department of Licensing. So in all of our conversations about customer service and enforcement and procurement, that was a feature of the, of the system that we had in mind. The second feature we had in mind is if there were automated options to be offered, uh, that that would be supported by or entirely or with support from private vendors, similar to the way the Oregon system operates. And then thirdly, uh, we assumed that the ultimate responsibility for the system as a whole, including the ultimate collection of revenue, provision of customer service, and determining how and under what terms vendors participate, that that uh, that responsibility would ultimately rest with the Department of Licensing. I'll turn now to each of the three workshops. I'll start with customer service, then we'll move into uh, procurement and certification, and we'll finish with enforcement. But I would like to pause to see if you have any questions or comments so far. One question, Travis. Please. Um, did you say we were gonna actually have another pilot test in 22? We will have a series of small pilot tests. Okay, I, I missed that. Thank you. They won't be statewide. They'll be small um, to test specific features of a RUC program. Senator Fortunato. Yeah, I like to. Uh, one of the things that are uh, that we need to look at is: Does DOL have the ability to set up an account for an individual for to keep track of RUC money? Because that's sort of a key to this whole thing. Is uh, I'm driving my car, I'm putting mileage on. No matter how I do my reporting or my payment, DOL has to have a separate account saying, Phil Fortunato, he has these vehicles, this many miles. Uh, and does DOL have any input on that? Because what I'm uh, uh, interested in is, let's just say we go with the, the manual reporting, and you're probably going to cover this, but I just won't get this out. Uh, I'm just going to do a, a bill pay where $25 a month goes into my RUC account. So I just do a bill pay, 25 bucks a month. It's mailed to DOL, and they then deposit it into my RUC account. Do they have the ability to do that? Um, 
So not not DOL precisely so. today. Uh, I'll, I'll speak first, but I'll invite Jill or others from DOL to to elaborate. I think not precisely that that approach today. Um, it is a concept that we discussed in these workshops that we would like to explore for further testing. It's slightly different from the other notion that is already being discussed in other quarters about creating uh, payment plans for vehicle licensing and, and registration fees in general, um, which um, you could imagine either as a, a series of prepayments, as you're describing, or as a series of, of post payments, which is an important distinction that we covered in, in these workshops. Um, so I, I don't know that DOL's system is capable of handling that today on either a pre or post payment basis, but Jill, I don't know if you want to uh, elaborate any further. Yeah, I can certainly jump in here. So um, Travis, you did, <laughs> you got it dead on. Um, so we currently don't have that functionality um, in our current drive system, um, just because the way vehicle registration is based on an annual basis, um, we don't have the ability right now for um, individual customers to just send us money that we apply directly to an account. Um, I think, um, Senator Fortune, are you kind of thinking of a setup similar to um, like the Good to Go program um, with WashDOT, where you, you can just con constantly be paying into that account? Um, unfortunately, we don't have that infrastructure at DOL right now. Um, obviously, it's something that we've talked about um, in the um, in the sense of RUC and also the vehicle payment plans. Um, but it's not the current infrastructure. Um, we would definitely have to do some some programming and um, you know, financial work um, behind that. But yes, thanks for the question. Uh, I guess to follow up, big deal yeah. or not so much of a big deal? Um, it depends on the scale. So I mean- A million dollars be, or a couple of hundred thousand dollars? Probably a couple million is what I'm thinking. Um, <laughs> just because it is pretty costly to change our drive system. Um, and we would need a pretty long runway to build something into our existing system. Um, but I think, you know, there are, there are elements of that infrastructure that are probably in place that we could build off of. Um, it's just not, not, not right now. Um, so I'm thinking, yeah, a couple hundred thousand probably wouldn't cover it necessarily just because it's, it would be pretty substantial and we'd probably have to get some contractors to help us with that. Right. And Travis, if I can indulge you just a little bit. Is it possible that we could dovetail with the good to go system? In other words, they already have a, play, uh, a system in place and we just simply use that existing system as a, a subset. So instead of tolls, we look at uh, who owns the good to go? Is that private or do we own that? We being the state? No, it's privately contracted out. Okay, well, that's a, that's a little... Uh, uh, but anyway, um, uh, maybe that's a possibility of having them uh, do a subset, for example, and say, we want you to establish not only a toll for everybody, because they already have that information, and then have this uh, say, hey, add, add this as a road usage charge and look into that. Senator, we did um, several years ago do an assessment of that kind of back-end connection, if you will, between the good-to-go account system and potentially RUC. And we saw potential there. Certainly, it would be um, decided by the vendor who's running good-to-go at the time. And and the state may want to do a you know more competitive solicitation. But at the end of the day, I think we've been assuming account management would be something that would be more cost-effectively and efficiently um, farmed out to the private sector to manage as opposed to trying to build a system that the state, a legacy system the state would have to deal with then. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, getting warmer in the sense that, Senator, a um, couple of the things that, and it's sort of a preview of the findings, uh, so I don't wanna leave anyone in suspense, but a couple of key um, insights, or uh, I wouldn't quite call them recommendations, but um, prepayment, is uh, in general, a very effective way of reducing the cost of collection for a number of reasons that cut across customer service and enforcement. Um, and so figuring out a way to effectively capture prepayment in a road use charge system is uh, perhaps uh, an investment well worth making because of the dividends it pays in the cost of operating the system down the road. And then a second uh, related comment is that um, to the extent that we are looking at periodic payment plans or prepayment or 
any sort of transaction approach that's different to what DOL currently does. Um, the idea of partnering with private sector vendors, commercial account managers to facilitate some of those features um, is another way to, um, to capture the benefits of what the private sector already has in place at a lower cost than perhaps building all of those features within the drive system or on top of the drive system, but rather by building them or connecting them from the private sector uh, to the drive system through, uh, through interfaces uh, that, um, uh, that can more efficiently facilitate the types of features that you're suggesting. Okay, I'm gonna move into customer service, uh, which was the first of the uh, three workshops. So uh, it touches many of the functions of road usage charging. And we gave the group, which again, consisted of Jill and some of her colleagues from the Department of Licensing that work in customer service there, as well as uh, customer service managers from Oregon's Orego program. And the challenge statement was to design a customer service center at a low cost of operations. Very broad, uh, generic uh, statement. We didn't wanna bound the problem too much. We wanted to give our workshop participants plenty of space to explore a variety of, of uh, possible features and uh, policy and system solutions that could help make customer service a, a less costly aspect of, of a road usage charge system. Next slide. So we thought about, um, before we got into more detailed discussions of how to reduce cost, what is the customer journey? So we sort of mapped out what's it like as a customer to go from not having to pay a road usage charge to being involved in the system, enrolling in it, reporting mileage, getting an invoice or a statement, paying it, and then perhaps exiting the program. So we framed a lot of the discussion that we had in the workshop around this journey and around the types of services and systems that would be needed to support customers, regardless of whether they're doing a simple manual reporting approach with prepayment or postpayment, or whether they're uh, opting for a more sophisticated uh, automatic type of uh, mileage reporting with technology. This journey would be uh, consistent regardless. So we wanted to think through what are the features, services, and systems that would be needed. Next slide, please. So a few of our insights as we moved along the journey, we started with, um, oops. Okay, looks like we have a recording that's telling us the meeting will end in 10 minutes. We're gonna try and solve that. If we get kicked off, we will send everybody an email <laughs> in uh, 10 minutes with a link to rejoin. Um, hopefully we can solve that before we get to the end of the, of the, of the seven minutes and 30 seconds there. Um, a couple of key things to balance in customer service. Uh, first of all, we wanted to balance satisfaction, the notion of wowing the customer. And by, by that, we mean this is not just about compliance. It's about providing a high quality experience. Uh, secondly, educating customers so that they know what they need to do and keep in, in so doing, keeping it simple and easy for them to complete the necessary tasks. Balance that uh, aspiration to provide a very high quality customer experience with the need to keep it simple and low cost to administer, which means also establishing clear boundaries for the agencies that are involved in operating the program and an ability to uh, monitor uh, their performance with measures and metrics. Next slide, please. Okay, so uh, the, following the customer journey from before a person is a customer, when they're a member of the public who may or may not be subject to a road usage charge, um, we thought about a public communication funnel, um, which means taking the communication that's going out from uh, the government to the public about this new feature, this new fee, uh, starting with generic information, but then gradually getting more specific to customers about how this program would impact them. And then lastly, what do they need to do in order to comply with the program? Uh, we recognized in, in the context that um, there is low trust in government in general, and that agencies uh, have to contend with that in, in instrumenting programs like this. One way to combat that is to understand customers and their circumstances. Great, thank you, Annalise, for saving us so we didn't get kicked off. Appreciate that. <laughs> um, and balancing the need for transparency with what customers need to know. Obviously, Transparency is helpful for building trust, um, but too much transparency can be cumbersome as folks uh, sort through the details of the program. 
So a couple of policy related recommendations that came out of this conversation were allowing sufficient time for startup. Uh, we've already talked about that in the context of needing sufficient time to actually program changes to the system and hire vendors if that's part of the program. But there's also an important customer related and public communication uh, reason to have sufficient startup time before a program goes from enactment to launch. And that is to, to be able to provide enough time for the agency, in this case DOL, to provide outreach to customers and education so that, so that the customers who would be paying a RUC know what they need to do and how to do it. And secondly, uh, investing in that upfront public communication, just like uh, we talked about a moment ago with investing in perhaps a prepayment approach, is a worthy investment because it can lead to a lot of savings down the road in, in how the system operates and in voluntary compliance, which we'll talk about later. Enrollment. So once a customer goes from a member of the public who's hearing about this program to someone who's subject to it, they need to enroll somehow or otherwise be identified to pay a ruck. We know from the pilot tests that we, we have conducted uh, in Washington and elsewhere, uh, enrollment is one of the most difficult parts of, of a RUC program. It's where we had the most interaction with customers, the most number of calls, emails, complaints, confusion, questions, uh, need for help and wayfinding. Roshini talked about this a little bit in our last uh, workshop on RUC innovation. So from a customer service perspective, we thought about optimizing the channels and thinking about specifically what are the channels through which customers could enroll and being very clear with the public about what they are and perhaps uh, reducing them so that there's less confusion. Another thing that's important about enrollment is streamlining the data flow. Um, we, we discovered from pilot testing uh, that it takes a lot of information for customers to connect to uh, the RUC that they need to pay, their name, their address, uh, information about their vehicle, payment information, um, we all go through this when we're creating accounts. We have many accounts these days uh, in the world of e-commerce. Um, it's often cumbersome. When you have to type in a 17 digit VIN number, it's even more so. So what are some ways that we can streamline the process of enrolling customers by creating um, or leveraging existing data that are held, for example, in the drive system, making that the hub for information for customers so that they don't have to input as much information uh, in the enrollment process, make it easier. Related to that, uh, channels for distributing information. So it's not just about channels for collecting information from customers, but also for distributing information to them as they're going through the enrollment process to keep them informed and uh, uh, aware of what the requirements are. So uh, these have already been used, website, obviously, social media. Direct mail is an important piece of DOL's toolkit already for registration renewals. Um, we heard from DOL that uh, without those, the, um, the enrollment rates, excuse me, the renewal rates are, are highly dependent on getting that actual physical piece of mail to remind folks that it's time to renew. And one other point on this slide is QR codes, potentially using that as a way to shortcut some of the data entry requirements, which is uh, increasingly used, especially during the pandemic, anyone who's eaten out recently. Uh, we'll, we'll be familiar with that. Senator Fortunato, question. Yeah, so I don't quite understand why uh, enrollment is such a uh, issue. I mean, everybody that has a car already has a registration. It's automatically their enrollment. Right. Um, that's, that's sort of the insight is um, let's leverage that existing data. When we did the pilot test with the road usage charge, we created this sort of separate universe of drivers that was separate from the DOL system because we were doing a, a demonstration. So we needed people to provide all of their information to us anew. Uh, they started with just an email address from folks who volunteered. They get, hey, I'd, I'd like to volunteer. Here's my email address. Keep in touch with me and tell me how to enroll. Well, that's all we had to start with. So we had to extract, okay, now we need your name, your address, <laughs> your vehicle information, uh, additional information. We didn't collect payment information in the pilot, but that process was cumbersome. So starting with what you already have in the drive system is actually the most efficient way to reduce that extremely uh, um, sticky and uncomfortable interaction that we had with so many customers in the pilot testing. Right. So are we talking about enrollment in uh, the ongoing, I guess, pilot programs? Or are we talking about enrollment 
and when when this goes statewide? This would be enrollment in a in a live system. So if you imagine starting with a small number of vehicles in a live system of actual the vehicles that are actually paying. Um, if it's something less than all the vehicles in the state, then, then the DOL system needs to be have the capabilities to identify based on vehicle characteristics who's in, um, and then capture the information, the additional information that's needed on top of the existing vehicle data and vehicle owner data in their system to be able to take it to a, a, a road usage charge vehicle. Um. Okay, I mean, to me, this is just simply adding a field that says ruck. And then if there's something in that field, whether it be we determine it to be mileage or a yes or a no, or I mean, that's the indication that they're in this, that they're in this program. So anyway, we'll talk. I don't, I don't want to take up much more time on it, but thank you. No, oh, it's it seems simple. Um, but there's the communication element of that, too. Um, that, which is why the previous step of public education is, is worthy of investing, uh, not wanting to surprise customers that come to renew their vehicle only to learn that, oh, I'm subject to this road usage charge that I now have to figure out how to uh, how to report my miles or if it's all, already somehow captured automatically how to pay it. Uh, if I want to opt for a more sophisticated method of mileage reporting, how do I do that uh, and get connected to a technology vendor? So there's these additional steps and interaction points with customers, even if we already know from drives who they are and uh, what type of vehicle they have. I guess, I guess the suggestion I would have is that we start by simply uh, asking DOL to add a field for current mileage of your vehicle. So like, let's, let's just say January 1, people go in to register their car and now they are asked to provide their mileage. You know, at, at the registration, we don't do anything with that, but we, now we have that data. So we have that starting mileage and now they're getting used to entering that mileage when they go to uh, registration and you just include that in the registration process and then gradually you use that information to dovetail with a, a fully developed system. But that's a way of quote, educating them slowly without having a monetary impact uh, but getting them used to reporting their mileage at the registration process. So that's my thoughts. Great thought. Um, Nevada just started doing that, by the way, um, statewide. And uh, it's one of our pilot concepts that we'd like to build a prototype to, to figure out what's the easiest way to, to capture that information from folks in, in a simple and uh, reliable manner uh, that uh, because there's, it, it sounds simple, but ca capturing information from folks uh, like that uh, can, as, a, as a new step in the process can be can be challenging. So definitely we want to look at uh, what are the ways to optimize how we do that with the public. Sharon. Just to follow on Senator Fortunato, I just have to share with you, um, I'm trying to go to Hawaii next week. And to get into Maui, you have to fill out a form and upload your um, COVID vaccination card. So you don't have to be quarantine, quarantined for the whole time you're there. <laughs> so that's a big motivation to try to learn that system. But I'll tell you, uh, I had to go, I had to go back and forth on my computer to, to figure out how to do that darn form. So um, what I've been finding with other um, major systems is uh, going to YouTube with some really lovely short videos that tell me how to do stuff is a very helpful thing. So you might <laughs> add YouTube to your list. Uh, and, and again, be, be aware of uh, different ages of um, digital literacy because uh, I find now in restaurants, everybody has a QR code and I have no idea how to scan. Well, now I do have an idea how to scan it because I just learned how to do it filling out the Maui form. But um, the, if you're not a digital native, none of this comes very easily. That's a comment, not a question, thanks. <laughs> a great comment. Um, I'll just rebound with one additional point, which is that um, many vehicle owners uh, renew their, their, their tabs at sub-agent locations. Um, so there's an additional interaction through the sub-agents for capturing mileage data if that's the way the data are, are entered. It requires additional work from sub-agents 
and a transaction of that information literally from the customer uh, to the sub agent, which is well, not only an additional activity, but also an additional uh, point for possible errors. And it really, it's, it's just interesting how we learn. It's just, um, so, and the human touch, I think becomes more important the older one becomes. Great. Okay, let's move on to mileage reporting. I won't spend too much time. We've spent a lot of time over the last few years researching methods of mileage reporting. We know that there are many ways to do it, that uh, there is not a one size fits all approach, that we need choices, including self-reporting manual options, as well as automated options. Um, but a few things that we did discuss uh, for optimizing data collection, um, just some generic concepts that, that um, that we hadn't really associated with individual reporting methods. One is go where the customers go. Um, we estimated that there's probably a couple of dozen uh, transactions that a person makes related to their vehicle over the course of a year. Um, how can we leverage those existing transactions, not just with government, but also uh, private transactions. Um, using third-party verification for self-reporting and then how can we use incentives to encourage uh, compliance with, with data reporting? Last stop on the customer journey is invoicing and payment. Uh, perhaps the, the, maybe not the most complex part, but the most painful part, because this is when money is actually coming out of one's wallet. Um, so receiving the invoice transparency is critical, but it's important to offer levels of detail. Um, we've, we've done uh, we've seen some testing in other states of different approaches to invoicing. We had a specific invoice design that was used in the previous pilot test. Um, that's a really important piece of the, of the process for customer service is what does your invoice say? How easy is it to understand? How accurate is it? Um, what information do customers want to have on their invoice that maybe isn't there and how can they get access to additional information? Um, so you'll see one of our pilot concepts builds off of this in just a moment. It's important to balance the level of detail of data that's presented on an invoice with simplicity. I think we've all been to CVS and received that 10 foot long receipt with all the coupons and other details. Uh, maybe all you bought was toothpaste, uh, but it's really hard to actually locate that piece of information. Um, so balancing the detail with the ability for customers to actually understand what's on an invoice or a receipt is important. Um, we spent a little bit of time talking about the importance of customizing formats for different types of vehicle owners, fleets being a, a key example of uh, a vehicle owner that would require a different format than, than a regular customer. Uh, we discussed with DOL the ability to have um, for vehicles to be listed on multiple accounts for payment. In other words, you could list multiple, multiple vehicles uh, and do a single payment. But what was interesting was to learn that most household customers tend to renew one vehicle at a time. Even when they have two vehicles in a household with tab renewals that are close together, they typically don't go online and do both transactions at once. They tend to be done at separate points in time. Uh, we spent a lot of time talking about how to bundle RUC payments with other payments. That uh, can be a, a very important cost savings, especially when you consider the friction and cost of things like credit card fees, which take about 3% off the top. And finally, um, making RUC and registration renewal payment channels consistent so that customers uh, have a consistent experience across both. A few common threads from our workshop on uh, customer service. First was getting to know your customer and meeting them where they are, sometimes literally. Uh, so we wanted to think about what are ways that through a RUC system, the program can be designed in a way uh, to make it easy for folks to provide the information and, and payments that are required in a way that doesn't ask too much new of them. Um, secondly, deploying targeted support, especially in the early years. In other words, if a, if a program starts small, we're trying to build trust and understanding, a good way to do that is to be very customized in how the customer support is configured to make sure that folks don't get lost, confused, and frustrated. Third is to offer alternatives in everything we do. We've talked about that with regard to mileage reporting, going all the way back to the beginning of the steering committee's work, uh, but also this applies to payment lo locations and, and payment methods. And finally, customizing how issues are addressed. In other words, um, 
being able to triage customer issues and get them to who, who can solve their problems quickly. A gap we discovered is the importance of addressing customer changes. This can be an unraveling point for, um, for any system. And I'm sure you've all had a common experience um, where you, let's suppose you have an account uh, for some sort of service, um, something about your situation changes, maybe your address, your phone number, uh, your credit card number, you need to make one simple change. Well, um, sometimes making one simple change can beget other not so simple changes. And before you know it, you're on the phone with eight different departments of whoever the provider is trying to figure out how to simply make this one simple change. Um, so figuring out what the key and common types of customer changes are and how to manage them efficiently is a, a gap that we haven't really explored in road usage charging. It's something that DOL deals with regularly and has approaches for managing. But if we're introducing new requirements, we wanna think about how might those new requirements change and how might we be able to prevent an unraveling of the customer experience when they come to make those changes. Um, we thought deeply about customer service provision. This is a very ugly slide that should be a, a flow chart, but fundamentally, if a, we imagined um, a customer having a choice between paying an annual fee and a by the mile charge. Um, so there needs to be, if that's the scenario, uh, an easy support system to help customers make that choice of which one is uh, most convenient or beneficial to them. If they choose to pay by the mile, they might have a second choice to make, which is, do I wanna do simple self-reporting, the center to fortune auto method? Or do I want to enroll in some sort of technology-based automated reporting because of the extra benefits that are associated with that? Um, so you're making, in this scenario, you're asking the customer to make possibly two uh, successive choices. And if they opt for automated reporting, there could be yet a third choice with regard to what method or what provider. Um, that's a lot of choices to make. This goes back to enrollment. Uh, so providing tools that make this choice natural and seamless for customers is a helpful way to, it, we're all talking about cost of collection. This is a good way to reduce cost of collection because what it does, if you have a, a cleanly designed system, is it reduces the number of phone calls, emails, frustrated customers uh, that are taking up lots of time in the call center. Uh, which requires more and more uh, employees to manage. Um, so the better design you can have up front, the better customer experience you can have, the lower cost of collection. Next slide. Um, we, lastly, we spent a little bit of time talking about the configuration that DOL might have of a customer service center. And um, it seemed like a recommendation or near recommendation would be to create a new team that would be dedicated to RUC. Uh, this would help provide that high level of service in the, in the early days of a RUC program to have a special team of agents that could be dedicated to the topic, quickly answer any question about the program uh, for customers that do find themselves confused or lost or, or needing to make a change. Secondly, it's important because of the important role that subagents play in vehicle transactions that they also be trained in road usage charge systems and what at least their requirements would be, if any, in transacting with their customers. Third, uh, another common recommendation across other areas of this topic is to start small. As Rima likes to say, it's a, it's a dial, not a switch. Start small and gradually scale up uh, and let the knowledge within the customer service center disseminate among the agents that are operating uh, and providing that customer support over time. In the early days, VIP treatment is helpful um, for those RUC customers. They're the ones being asked to do something new. Um, so to build understanding and trust with them, treat them like, like uh, VIP customers. And then lastly, uh, this notion of a triage methodology came up. Um, this goes back to something I mentioned a moment ago. When you call for help, um, do you have 10 choices on the menu and is is the button you choose one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine? Does it actually take you to the place where that person can help you? Uh, what are the most efficient ways to triage customer issues? DOL obviously has a lot of experience with that. Um, and uh, if, we're, if we're tacking on an additional function for customers to pay report miles and pay a ruck, how can we integrate that into the triage methodology that's used there? 
All right, so we'll wrap up this topic. And I promise the next two are shorter. We spent, the, this was a 16 hour workshop uh, on customer service. So we had a lot of time together uh, and we came up with quite a few ideas for further testing. I'm going to present five today. And the first one is, uh, I alluded to most of these throughout this presentation. First one is to test alternative invoice concepts to enhance understanding and trust. Um, so the idea here would be, instead of just creating one type of invoice as we did in the 2018, 2019 pilot. So you may recall that if you got your invoice every month and opened it, it was pretty much the same format for everybody. What if we looked at different designs to figure out what elements, what data elements, what design elements on an invoice uh, inspire customers to be more trusting and more compliant. Uh, and this actually has the effect of reducing the cost of collection in the system because as we'll see in a moment, the more voluntary compliance you have, uh, the cheaper it is to collect a road usage charge. So the invoice or the driving statement uh, is an important part of that. Second concept is uh, what about using incentives to drive customers to lower cost methods of either mileage reporting or payment, such as online payments? Um, what are ways that we can build in incentives without undermining revenue uh, and without doing anything untoward uh, but what are some creative ways of thinking about using incentives to nudge customers toward decisions and behaviors that make it easier and less costly for the state to collect this new fee? Third, um, what about using other types of vehicle related transactions to collect mileage data and process payments? Um, you go get your oil changed if you still have a gasoline vehicle three or four times a year. Um, you maybe pay an insurance premium at least twice, maybe four or even 12 times a year. Um, there's obviously also the, the registration renewal process that may go through a sub-agent. Uh, what are these other types of vehicle related transactions and what are partnering opportunities where at least some of the elements of road usage charging could be bundled in with them to make it less new, less painful, fewer new things for customers to do. Next, what are the customer's preferences for who to talk to? and how they talk to them. Um, we spent a lot of time in this workshop uh, ruminating about our personal experiences and talking with experts from, from DOL and Orego who operate these systems about the evolution and provision of customer service, whether it's telephone-based, email-based, chatbot-based, a lot of robot chat features these days. Um, what are the optimal ways to provide customer service for something like reporting mileage? Um, and, and how can we think about doing that more efficiently through existing customer service channels? And lastly, uh, one idea was to map that customer journey. So going back to this notion of tapping into other vehicle related transactions, let's actually follow a customer for an extended period of time uh, on their and map out all of their vehicle related transactions and figure out how we can leverage any of the existing data, payments, uh, mileage reporting, other vehicle data reporting that, that is already being transacted between customers and private and public entities. I will pause there. Um, we spent a lot of time on customer service. Uh, we had five, uh, five concepts to consider that could be either standalone or bundled with other um, pilot testing elements for our small scale pilots in 2022. Uh, but I'd love to hear feedback, questions, and comments on uh, customer service and how we can do it more cost effectively. Senator Fortunato. Well, uh, not particularly uh, customer service, but sort of related. My, the biggest problem that I see is uh, Eastern Washington farmers who are driving, you know, maybe 90% of their time on their own farm and separating that from their, their road charges and trying to work that in. I think that is the, and, and that can be done by GPS, but uh, uh, I, I think that's the biggest problem with a self-reporting system and a, you know, and a customer service thing. So we need to try to look at that and figure that out. Thank you, uh, Representative Orca. Thanks. I just want to say, you know, I, I like the idea of incentives. I hate mandates. 
So do not any way, shape, manner, or form mandate somebody go to the lower cost reporting option. Um, leave it up to, to them. And I think, okay, uh, incentives are great. Um, just don't put disincentives uh, in place. Don't punish somebody because they're not techno savvy uh, or they don't like or don't trust you know, a technologically driven one. Uh, but yeah, fine, lower the cost for those who, who are willing to go that route. Thank you. Senator. I'm sorry. Um, you know, one of the other things that concerns me is the, uh, I guess, the thrust to make sure that every single person pays so that you wind up with a more expensive system trying to protect against the three percent or five percent or whatever that might find some loophole that they can take advantage of and so you know i've seen this in the past where they spend 25 30 percent of their time and energy in the entire system to protect against the two or three or four percent that that might be able to skate by so that's that's another uh, consideration that uh, you know, maybe it's worth it to just forget about those people. I mean, there's always going to be there's always going to be those few that are on the border that are that are doing uh, doing something that may be able to get around the system. And the question that comes in is, is it worth it to enhance a system so much to to get that little bit of extra collection, but it winds up costing you more money? So that's my comment. Great preview for our third topic on enforcement, which is exactly the question we're trying to get at is, okay, at what point do we just kind of give up, right? It doesn't make sense to tend to spend $10 to chase $1. Um, yeah. So uh, balance, creating that balance. Uh, and as a preview, the, the, the overall philosophy that we, we came to in the workshop was, it's better to spend the balance of your effort promoting and encouraging and incentivizing voluntary compliance. In other words, making making the system in a way that people are uh, uh, encouraged to easily comply, as opposed to making it so difficult that you create a lot of uh, inadvertent evaders who maybe it's not that they're opposed to paying or don't want to pay. It's just that we made it too hard for them, so they didn't. <laughs> um, so we, uh, in general, the, the balance of resources being spent on making it easy as opposed to enforcement is, is one of the key takeaways from this entire series of workshops. Okay, I don't see any other questions. Um, move into the second of the three workshops, which was on the um, rather, ar not arcane, what's the word here? Um, this can get a little bit technical, procurement and certification. Um, when we talk about procurement and certification, mostly what we were thinking about was for the for the mileage reporting options that require some technology, uh, the plug-in devices that some of you experienced in the last pilot test, um, perhaps a smartphone app, uh, perhaps in the future, in-vehicle telematic systems. These types of technology-based reporting that DOL uh, would never uh, aspire to create themselves, but rather leverage what the private sector already has. How can the state effectively uh, procure these types of features and services uh, and do it in a way that encourages lower cost provision of these, of these features from the market? So these, these features touch just about every aspect of a road usage charge system other than uh, perhaps enforcement which we left as a function for the state to worry about. So our design challenge statement was to design a regional procurement and certification process for RUC vendors with a market contract accessible by multiple states through service level agreements. That is a mouthful, so I'm gonna break it down on the next slide. What we mean by regional procurement is, is it possible to create a process where multiple states can collaborate and share information on the design of RUC elements that they can outsource. In other words, can they, if not literally share the same contract and contracting process, but at least have a common process that makes it easier for vendors to compete and provide services across multiple states. 
By certification process, we mean the process of qualifying those vendors for specific functions and granting them certification to do business in one or more states, as opposed to procuring them. By market contract, we mean standard commercial terms under which any qualified vendor could operate. Those details could vary from state to state. And then lastly, a service level agreement. Uh, this contains performance standards that vendors need to meet in order to maintain their qualification. So to put some of these concepts in context on the next slide, uh, hopefully to make it a little bit clearer, we talk about the spectrum of procurement possibilities and some examples of how this is currently being done elsewhere. So as you go from left to right, um, on the far left, you have this notion of full government delivery, uh, setup, operations, maintenance, uh, provision of mileage reporting systems, fee collection, customer support, and account management. You could imagine if DOL were to do all of that in-house uh, in, some, in some manner, that would be a full government delivered system. Um, second from the left would be similar to that, except that imagine that DOL were to contract out to private partners for specific functions, which is sort of like how uh, the, the system is currently operated with DOL with uh, vendors that provide some of the uh, IT support, the drive system, and you can think of the uh, sub-agents also as, um, as uh, private partners that provide the specific function of fee collection. Moving a little further to the right, um, it's possible for a state to contract with a single vendor to provide all of the customer functions with oversight by the agency. We call this competition for the market. In other words, you create a competitive moment for competing vendors to provide their bids to the state. You select either the cheapest or the best, however that's measured in a procurement process. You select that vendor and they then conduct the, uh, the bulk of the operations of the system for a period of time. And when that time is up, it's recompeted. So the vendors in the marketplace are always having to recompete for their services, which instills some level of competition. This is how Utah currently has procured their REC system. Uh, it's how Virginia is in the process of procuring theirs. And it's how Oregon pro uh, procured the state account manager piece of their REC system. It's also uh, how I believe Wash we could characterize WashDOT's uh, good to go uh, procurement. A little further to the right, um, how Oregon does its current uh, commercial account managers for its REC system is to provide contracts to multiple qualified vendors to provide customer functions still with oversight by the state. And now you have multiple vendors providing the mileage reporting and fee collection functions. So they're competing with each other in the market as opposed to winner take all, one vendor can, can do the whole thing. And then furthest to the right is similar to, to that, but, and this is how New Zealand does their rep program, the market would be open at any time for any qualified vendor to come in and provide those customer functions. And instead of having a procurement with a contract, the government would simply certify that these vendors are qualified to do the function of, of RUC uh, mileage reporting and fee collection. An analog to this that um, Jill raised several times in our workshops was DOL's uh, in ignition interlock device program. Uh, so vehicle uh, owners who are required to have an ignition interlock device uh, can choose from a certified list of private vendors that provide that technology. Uh, DOL maintains a list on their website. Uh, customers can choose whoever they want, install the device, and DOL simply verifies that, uh, that they have done it. Um, so there is a sort of a precedent within DOL for, for this type of contracting arrangement. Okay, so we broke down our workshop into two key findings. One was what would be the elements of a market contract if we were to go down this road of having an open market where any RUC vendor could come in and provide RUC services, the mileage reporting technology, the customer service, the fee collection, what would be the key elements of a contract that the state would wanna have with them? Um, so we broke that down into the common features that would be common across states, things like data collection, account management, and customer service, common issues to manage across states like privacy protection, data security, and overall performance, and the commercial terms on the upper right. Um, states could share benchmarks for the performance, things like reliability, accuracy, 
customer service. They could also share terms on compensation. So how are the vendors going to get paid for these services uh, by the state, either directly or indirectly? And they could consider uh, bonding as part of that uh, commercial term. There would be key differences from one contract, or excuse me, from one state to the next. States may wanna have unique setup requirements, uh, performance metrics across different mileage reporting methods. Um, the policy features of RUC systems from one state to the next are very likely to vary. Um, so things like fuel tax credits, uh, location-based reporting, um, these are going to vary. So that means that the market contract for provision of the service will also need to vary on some of those points. And then the last key element on the lower right is the contract duration. How long would the contract, or if it's a certification approach, um, what is the nature of the certification? How long does it last? How long, uh, how long in between renewals and what's required in order for a certification to be renewed? So in addition to the market contract, we then thought for most of this workshop about multi-state certification. Um, we think this is a tremendous opportunity to reduce the cost of collection of road usage charge for the technology-based mileage reporting methods. Um, there are a number of vendors already in the marketplace that provide these services. Um, they're providing them to multiple states, Oregon, Utah, and Virginia. Um, so how can multiple states think about how to create a marketplace, a healthy marketplace of vendors that provide common services on a certification basis. And this makes it cheaper in two ways. The first way is that if states use a common certification approach, the cost to the state of actually undertaking a procurement can come significantly down. Um, there's a lot less time, research, and effort devoted to creating the procurement documents, going through the procurement process, negotiating with vendors, contracting them, overseeing them, enforcing contract terms, and so on. Uh, so on the state side, there's a significant opportunity for cost reduction that's ongoing. On the vendor side, if there is a common certification framework, this reduces the cost to the vendor community of doing business for road usage charging. Imagine if you're a vendor that wants to provide mileage reporting services, not just in one state, but in every state that has a RUC program, but you're confronted with um, different contracting rules, different requirements in every state. And even if those requirements are very similar, you still have to go through the process of proving yourself to each state one by one. If instead the states were to band together and create a framework for being able to certify vendors that meet all of the standards that they have in common, then I as a vendor can provide my services at a much lower cost because I don't have to deal with you know, as many as 50 individual states. I can deal with one certification process to cover the bulk of the things that the states care about. So we wanted to think about in that certification process, what would be the things that would be most useful to certify? So we came up with mileage reporting technologies themselves, the account management systems and customer service systems. We also thought a lot about what are existing standards out there that states could leverage so they don't have to reinvent the wheel when it comes to certifying things like the financial viability of a vendor. And third, um, how can we create uh, a standards development process, including testing procedures and test results that could be used by multiple states? Again, this was all, all in the vein of making life easier for vendors and, and thus less costly. Next slide, please. Three key strategies for making testing more manageable for states. So imagine you're in a certification environment where vendors are being asked to prove that they are certified to provide RUC services. Um, one is self-certification. So there are techniques for allowing vendors to self-certify certain features of their products and services. A second way is outsourcing. That means having an outside certification entity, and there are many commercial entities that will do certification. They could do it on behalf of multiple states. And then finally, uh, internal testing. We show this as an upside down pyramid because uh, the more you can rely on self-certification and outsourcing, the less costly it is for the state to actually certify vendors. Inevitably, as we did in the, in the last pilot, there were certain features that need to be tested internally by each state. 
but if you can minimize that, you can reduce costs. <clears throat> I'm gonna skip this slide in the interest of time, but we thought through a lot of the details of what could be certified within those three categories of mileage reporting technologies, account management systems, and customer service systems. Um, and we also came up with a number of external standards that could be leveraged as part of that certification process, including things like privacy protection, data security, payment processing, banking, accounting, proof of financial sustainability, and insurance. In other words, uh, if you want to come be a vendor in Washington, you need to, you need to come with all of these certifications that are standard in the marketplace for a lot of information technology companies, um, bring these certifications, and that's a part of your uh, clearance to be able to provide this service in, in our state. The other thing we thought about certification is how do we create value such that multiple states would want to participate? Um, certification can be cost effective, more cost effective than each state working alone, um, but only if there's a lot of states doing it. Suppose only Oregon and Washington created a certification program. Well, that's great for vendors that wanna work in Oregon, Washington, but there's 48 other states. Um, so the vendors may still yet be confronted with the challenge of navigating a difficult uh, procurement and regulatory environment in those other states. So how can we create a certification process that encourages this open market that other states would want to tap into? So we thought of a few ways of doing that. One is to identify trusted certifiers. That would be, uh, um, entities that could actually conduct the certification. Second would be to scale the level of rigor in the certification process to the program size. So if you're a small state with a small program, you may not want to opt in to the same level of detailed certification that a large state with a large RUC program would have. Third is we wanna to work toward the vendors paying for the cost of certification as opposed to the state paying for it creating a process for monitoring and recertifying that's shared across states, varying the certification approach based on what type of vendor it is and what type of service they're providing. And then lastly, this is a common theme, start small. So to conclude this section, two big ideas for further research in 2022. Um, we didn't come up with any pilot ideas involving test drivers per se, uh, but we did, we did uh, derive a couple of contributions that we believe Washington could make uh, to reduce the cost of collection through advancing this notion of vendor certification. One is to create and vet with the, with the industry and with other states, a model market contract. Uh, much like we did a couple of years ago with the model privacy policy, a model market contract could be very useful for states. This would make the uh, vendor procurement process more familiar from state to state if states were to start with a model contract instead of working from scratch each time. Second, testing an approach to creating and maintaining essential RUC standards. In other words, if we're going to have a certification process, what are we certifying to? What are those standards? Who's making them and who's maintaining them? Um, that has never been attempted for RUC outside of Oregon doing it all by their lonesome as the first state to do this. Um, but we believe that uh, designing and testing and actually beginning a process of creating RUC standards that other states could buy into could create a model that, that could then be carried on by a larger group of states or maybe even a federal government if there's interest to build these standards, which again, makes it a lot easier for service providers in this space to provide their services across state boundaries in a much more cost-effective way. So I will pause there. That concludes topic two on procurement. Apologies if it was a bit um, technical, but um, at the end of the day, these are the two ideas we had for carrying forward into next year. Please, Sharon, go ahead. Um, well, these are all arguments for our federal system. Uh, just, uh, and I know the state legislators on the Zoom will not like it when I say, well, this is why we have like a National Institute of Standards, why we have 
a preemption of state law. Um, but that said, there, I like your idea of finding trusted certifiers because I happen to know from prior work on corporate boards that there are such things that like help whole corporations figure out state sales taxes, for example, and just set up systems for that corporation to use to make sure they're right with each state they have a physical nexus with. Uh, there's also something called the um, Uniform State Law Commissioners. And I don't know, Travis, how, my question is, have, and I understand we have a federal representative on the Zoom today, just how much back and forth work you're doing with such organizations or um, our counterparts at, in the federal transportation um, matrix. <clears throat> Can you repeat the name of that, that group, Sharon, the Uniform? Law, state Uniform Law Commissioners. It, it, they found something like the Uniform Commercial Code, which exists in every, it's been a very old organization. It's been around for, it's called the UCC, been around for years. Yeah. But every state legislature can have, you know, its own variation on the Uniform Commercial Code, but it is something that drafts laws that then are useful to state legislatures. I'm not personally familiar with that. I'd love to do more research um, oh. on that point specifically. There's a, there's a University of Washington um, professor who's a currently a member of that body. I'll make sure that she, that I send you her coordinates. <clears throat> Okay, terrific, thank you. And I'm actually live texting with a colleague who uh, is an attorney who is going to uh, gather some more information for us too. Okay, great. Um, the second point you made about um, the federal um, coordination or involvement in standard setting for RUC, um, I don't wanna put Mike on the spot if he's still on the call even, um, uh, but I know that um, the uh, federal government obviously has an interest in this topic. Um, they've been funding grants like the one that's that's funding this project in Washington, as well as a number of other states. But the level of activity at the federal level directly has been pretty modest to date. Um, so uh, it, it's conceivable that there could be an interest in uh, carrying forward something like a standards creation activity uh, within the Federal Highway Administration, for example, or NIST, as you alluded to. Um, so our, our idea was sort of to provoke that through a state level effort to see if we can create a model for how it might work uh, that could then be carried on by others uh, through our, our pilot testing in 2022. I, I found when I was a state utility regulator that uh, there's nothing the feds fit, uh, and, and the corporate world fears more than a crazy quilt of state laws. <laughs> so it often, it often prompts a uh, Mutual action. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad we're on the right track. That's reassuring. <laughs> okay, um, I don't see any other hands up. I'm gonna try and quickly get through the last uh, segment on enforcement. Um, so this will connect back to a point that um, Senator Fortunato made just, be just before we launched into the last section. So the Challenge statement here was to design a low cost enforcement regime that captures a relatively high percentage of violation events. Notice we didn't say all violation events because we wanna be practical about um, uh, the, the cost benefit of going after every dollar. So next slide shows how we thought about this and um, our little rainbow people here are not proportional. This is illustrative. Um, the idea here is that if you categorize uh, those vehicle owners that would be subject to a roadie's charge by uh, their level of compliance, it might shake out like this. You would have hopefully most people who are what we say voluntarily compliant. Um, then you have another group of people that are unintentionally compliant. They forgot or they did it wrong. Uh, that can be further divided into short-term unintentional versus long-term unintentional non-compliance. Uh, they moved away, they totaled their vehicle and didn't tell you, perhaps they passed away. Uh, these are all uh, categories of, of non-compliance that, that we like to characterize as unintentional. Um, then there's intentional non-compliance. Um, we qualitatively and very uh, uncarefully categorize these as intentionally non-compliant for a good reason and intentionally non-compliant for a not good reason. Um, 
I don't think legally that you can enforce <laughs> one or the other, but in a system, uh, certainly when it connects back to customer service, one of the one of the themes of our customer service conversations was empathy. Um, so those who are unintentionally, excuse me, intentionally non-compliant for hardship reasons, for example, uh, there may be ways to uh, to create programs that allow them to become compliant, uh, which would have more effectiveness than uh, a hardship program for folks who are on an, who are intentionally compliant um, for a reason, perhaps uh, just disagreement with the with the program fundamentally. Um, then we have the last category of intentionally non-compliant. So this would be uh, fraud or uh, deliberate evasion, widespread cheating, for example, or odometer rollback schemes, this sort of thing. The basic concept that we were trying to think through as we had our enforcement workshop was how do we create as many voluntarily compliant customers as possible? How do we design a system that has the largest number of folks in that first category and continuously move uh, customers up this list toward the top. Um, so we'll go on to the next slide. We spent the bulk of our effort on that. So a few strategies. Um, first is design. Um, design for compliance with simplicity, centralized information, ease of payment. This all connects back to the discussions we had in the customer service workshop. So we didn't actually have any new insights that would be pilot testable here beyond what we already discussed in the customer service uh, section, but a few additional uh, points that we that we discussed here that were helpful for, for compliance. Second one is language. Um, how important language is in helping people not only understand, but feel um, compelled to uh, comply with a program. Uh, and not necessarily through the stick approach as, as Representative Orkut uh, alluded to earlier, but through the carrot approach. So there are ways to use language to, I, I hesitate to use the word inspire when we're talking about a tax program, but inspire people to uh, comply. So simple language, clear language, eye-catching reminders. Related to that is the notion of coaxing. Uh, and this would be working constructively and, and compassionately with those who are uh, non-compliant for reasons of hardship using kind language uh, and avoiding things like uh, punishment or shaming in the language that's used. Other strategies we've talked about uh, at length and that will be subject to our, our pilot test program next year, our payment plans, uh, grace periods, and as discussed earlier, incentives. How much enforcement is enough? Um, so this gets directly to the question Senator Fortunato asked a moment ago. Uh, in Oregon, they have thresholds that are established before they actually send an account to collections. Um, I think it's $125. If you're in arrears, $125, they send your RUC account to collection. Um, that threshold is an administrative choice, but the notion of having one can be helpful because it avoids uh, spending time on small amounts of, of revenue that maybe aren't worth the effort to collect. Uh, for automated reporting, we can rely on those commercial account manager partners. We always have registration renewal as a backstop. That doesn't necessarily help with revenue coll collection. It may basically turns vehicle owners into unregistered vehicle owners. Uh, it nonetheless does provide a natural point of, uh, of uh, encouragement to comply. Lastly, when we're thinking about how strict or how much is enough enforcement, we always want to be mindful of the equity impacts of proactive enforcement strategies, which is why, for example, we, we uh, did not consider things like registration holds or uh, vehicle license revocations as part of an enforcement system for road usage charging. There are a couple of multi-state enforcement tools that could be accessed in a RUC system uh, that would allow states to work together to more cost-effectively uh, do enforcement on unpaid accounts for those customers that do fall into non-compliance for whatever reason. One of them is the National Motor Vehicle Title Information System. I think I learned how to pronounce this, NIMVITIS. And the other is Carfax or a similar service like Carfax that has vehicle uh, history reports accessible. Um, so the idea would be here that states could uh, share basic data 
uh, about their registries that would facilitate cross-state enforcement uh, to ensure that as folks are moving from one state to the next uh, and leaving unpaid accounts, um, they're, not, uh, they're not skipping the bill basically. So to recap, um, in the last five minutes, some of the themes that we uh, came across time and again throughout this workshop series. First is the importance of a high quality customer experience for creating voluntary compliance and reducing uh, the friction between customers and service providers. Second is the careful use of language and how important language is in, in promoting understanding and, uh, and uh, willingness to voluntarily comply, which is the third point. Fourth point is uh, multi-state collaboration is helpful, but not for everything. Um, there are some key areas where multi-state collaboration can be beneficial for identifying lower cost methods of implementing some elements of RUC. And those would be information sharing, capacity building, and certification. Didn't say enforcement here. Um, we're sort of in the initial stages of exploring how an Invitis or a Carfax could be useful across state lines, but it seemed that certification was the big one. Next. Prepayment, um, collecting money from customers up front actually makes it easier for customers. Uh, in most of the conversations we had, uh, it also makes it easier for the state administering the program uh, to hold on to the revenue and not have to chase uh, customers who are unpaid. And also to recap the pilot concepts, um, you can just go ahead and click through all of these, uh, Roshini. Uh, we presented these as they came up, um, but we had five ideas under customer service, two under procurement and certification. And then for enforcement, I, sorry, I forgot to mention it, but um, the idea uh, that we had emerged from the enforcement workshop was uh, what approaches we might use for verification or audit in a manual reporting system. Um, so could this be, for example, odometer image requests or uh, certified odometer readings at various intervals on a spot check basis. So how might we think through and pilot test some of those techniques for verification of manual reporting? We have five minutes left, so I'll stop there. Um, we have a lot of pilot concepts on the table that came out of this workshop series. I'd love to hear any additional feedback. Um, got great comments throughout today, um, but we have five more minutes left. Love to hear more. Representative Orca. Thank you. You mentioned on a previous slide about um, vehicle registration renewals being a backstop. Um, we've got a pretty high number of unregistered uh, vehicles in this state. And I'm just wondering, have you looked at this to see um, what the likelihood of an increase in unregistered vehicles would be as a result? We have not. Um... That could be a worthy uh, research question to test. Um, I can say another idea that we have um, penciled out but not put into a slide because we're not sure it's ready <laughs> for prime time is um, looking at among those unregistered vehicles, trying to figure out, uh, diagnose the extent of the, of the perceived problem. Uh, it's hard to know what you don't know, I guess, in this case. So if, if someone's not registered, how can, you, how can you be sure they're not registered because they're not in the system? Um, so there are research techniques to quantify the, the, the extent of that problem and not just how many vehicles are unregistered at any given time, but how long have they been unregistered, which is also important. Um, so we think that understanding that could be helpful for uh, future enforcement of a road usage charge system, but also for future enforcement of any kind of vehicle fee system. Um, that that would be used to uh, augment uh, declining gas tax revenues, even if it's not based on mileage. In other words, I think we should take that one for the research. So thanks for the suggestion. Okay. Um, We'll hang out for three more minutes in case folks have questions or comments. Um, but uh, before we break, uh, next steps, we have the equity spotlight, which was the, thir the third and final in the fall series. In uh, three weeks, well, three weeks from yesterday, Tuesday, November 23rd, just before Thanksgiving at 9 a.m. 
And then we have our full steering committee meeting on Monday, December 13th, scheduled for 10 to 2.30. These are both virtual meetings. We will be, there's already a Zoom invitation should be in your calendars for those of you who can make the spotlight. And we will be setting up a um, Zoom registration link for the steering committee meeting. That one's a little bit different. Uh, we'll actually have a registration link online for folks to sign up for that one uh, sometime later this month. We'll put that one out for your, uh, but, should, but we'll get it on your calendars in the meantime, in any case. Thank you everybody for attending. Great attendance, great participation. We appreciate all the feedback. Uh, we have a lot of work to do to wrap these spotlights together into uh, a nice coherent series of pilot test proposals at our December meeting for your consideration. So I appreciate your ongoing feedback. Any additional comments or questions, feel free to write Rima or me at any time. Hey, you did a great job, Travis. Thank you, Senator. Thanks, everybody. Have a great rest of your week. Thanks, everyone.